Completing the North American Waterfall Slam was nothing short of a dream, and I don't think I could have scripted a better ending to it. Bittersweet is a word that gets thrown around a lot, and as incredible as it was, it's hard to put into words the emptiness it left when it was over. Fucking get out! King, right there off the shore! Woo! It's like winning a championship in sports. You've won the trophy, but now what? There's a void to fill, and at the same time, the bar has been raised. It's almost an expectation, but let's be honest. Expectations are what robs you of the chance to learn anything. There's no challenge to overcome when things go as expected, and a new challenge is exactly what I needed. That's an amazing season to take that, to kill 43 different species of ducks in one season during a global pandemic. So uh, would you do it again? Would I do the waterfall slam again? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes, but... I'm gonna do a different waterfall slam. As cumbersome as it seems at times, the travel aspect within a story like this is a necessary chapter for me. It's when it all starts to settle in and feel real. It's that locker room moment before a game when you just focus in silence, and then the coach comes in and gives the pep talk, and all hell breaks loose. Just got to the blind and non-stop action. Got We arrived in time for an afternoon hunt on that first day. I had high hopes, but I didn't expect anything like that. Not only did I scratch off the first five species in a matter of an hour and a half, but I also realized that duck hunting here may in fact rival the legendary dove hunting that Argentina is known for. The fast action in the blinds made time pass quickly, 
but getting those first few birds in my hand grounded me in the reality that this was going to be a numbers game. I could already tell I'd have to start passing on pintails and speckled teal if I wanted to keep moving down my list. This is the first bird I grabbed here in Argentina, and this is what I'm here for. I'm learning every step of the way. This is a silver teal, first one I held in my hands. I mean, look at that bill. It looks like somebody painted it. This is an absolute gorgeous duck. Gentlemen, how'd it go? Awesome. Great. Amazing. Look at this. The silver wing teal. They call it the silver wing teal, obviously for the silver there. But if you look at some of these, feathers this really a bunch of people take this to do flies and stuff like that off the back end they are beautiful that bird just gorgeous it's crazy yeah so we got the ring neck teal this one's still probably an immature to be perfectly honest with you because it doesn't have quite the color on the head but certainly on the feathers it does so that's a ring neck teal pretty little bird and then the other one here is the micero which is the speckled teal okay it's a pretty bird then we move forward to the yellow build there he is yellow bill pintail that's the one this one and the rosy bill are the most numerous birds this is like a this would be the mallard, mallard the and the other mallard would be the rosy bill so there's okay. two mallards in argentina this is one of them okay this is the big one and then this one which i'm very 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 happy to see which i haven't seen in the last couple weeks and was worried we weren't going to get into is the white cheeked pintail. So the pintails here are very different in the states. Males have one sprig that goes straight out. Uh -huh. Also this would be a male, one sprig straight out. The females have the same thing but it's two sprigs that go straight out. Uh -huh. But other than that they're, they're relatively bland compared to what a pintail would be in the states. Uh -huh. Nonetheless those are our five species from today. That's gorgeous. So, An awesome good first afternoon. Right Thank you. Awesome. Since this entire slam would take place below the equator, the birds were moving north to warmer weather in the months of May and June as winter tightened its grip on the southern hemisphere. Typically, this is the time reserved for long hours of glassing bears in the mountains or listening for early morning gobbles in the foggy timber ridges of West Michigan, but not this year. Yet somehow, I think I'm going to be okay with that. Teal. All right, there you go. <laughs> the next three days consisted of both morning and afternoon hunts, bouncing between different pieces of water. It seemed like no matter where we went, the ducks would always show up. There were a few ag fields in the area, and to no surprise, ducks did what ducks do everywhere in the world, feed here, rest there. And depending on the species, it seemed like we found different birds holding to different locations based on variations in shoreline habitat and water depths. Once we noticed that, things started to add up quick. We did get into a couple different species today that we didn't yesterday. Obviously a gorgeous cinnamon teal, fulvous whistling duck, which ironically this is the one we had to go to Sinaloa for in the North America waterfall slam, so I've got fond memories of that. What we got here? This is a white-faced tree duck. A lot like a whistling duck, make the same sounds, a little bit smaller, but that- Awesome that, face. Yeah, just that head, they're really, really, you can really pick them out. Look at the different air. colors throughout right too, the reds. They're just, they're pretty cool. And when they're flying, you can really tell because they got that stumpy butt on yep. you know? By the end of day two, I was able to add the white-faced tree duck, fulvous whistling duck, and cinnamon teal. Three more species, which would bring my count to eight of 20 on my list. Day three had us focused in on a Chilean widgeon. We had seen three the first afternoon, but there had to be more. It only seemed like a matter of time before we'd get our chance. Ironically, our chance came that afternoon, shortly after getting my hands on a rosy-billed poacher. The 
one we were sitting for right here. Chilean Widgeon. And I think it's probably the coolest one that we've got so far. The coloring on this is just awesome. Big white chest on it. A little green on the head. That's sweet. Two more species off, yet another new piece of water, and bringing me to the halfway point of 10 total species so far. It almost seemed too easy, and between Maxi calling out the birds and having seen literally thousands in flight, I was confident of being able to ID a lot of them in the air by now. Confident though I was, there were still three species that I can say for certain we hadn't seen yet. The Brazilian teal, red shoveler, and the black-headed duck. The black-headed was going to be the hardest one to get while we are here in Argentina. They only fly in the twilight hours of dawn and dusk. Not ideal from a filming perspective, let alone having to wait for enough light to pick them out amongst the five different kinds of teal that are here. After an early morning flight, they tend to take cover in the tall grass and reeds that line the edges of the open water, and they fly faster than any duck down here. This ended up being a key factor in identifying them in the low light of the fourth morning hunt. That's, oh. th that's what we're looking for. Something like that. Coming in fast. Coming in. And erratic flyers. See the bird. Somebody's feeling it this morning. Maybe a blackhead over there. Sure looks the part. I think I may go snag that one, Matt, just see what it is. Got a blackhead. Matt! Got a blackhead! Very good. Well, the plan worked. We got in early, so we wanted to see if we could catch a blackhead. And this one was coming right to left this morning, and there was something different about it. And as I shot it, crippled over here, I had to put another one on the water, and then finally couldn't take enough, had to go look, got the binos. Glassed him up and there he is, blackhead. This right here was gonna be the toughest one in Argentina to get. And it was just gonna take a lot of getting up early, getting out, being set on time. Oh, that is a big relief though. And look how gorgeous that head is. We're gonna get, oh man, a good shot. We're gonna get back in that blind, see if we can't get on a shoveler this morning. But this guy right here, this was the one that I was, I was worried about. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Yeah, these are those quick little jets in the morning. I think, I, truthfully, I think there's another one down there. I was gonna say, too. I bet you, because there was one that floated that you shot again. Yep. There's another one out, out there that was stone dead. That's awesome. <laughs> that is, I said, that's I, the one. I, I picked up my binos and I looked at it. Yep. What's that? That was the pressure one right there. That was. That's. This is the one. All right. Let's find a shoveler. Shoveler. We just had two red shovelers that flew by about a hundred yards, but we saw where they landed over there. So we're gonna get on shore, go over. I got my binos with me. We'll glass them up. See if they're somewhere that we can't sneak in on them. For whatever reason, the red shoveler's kind of been that nemesis on the trip. We always see them a little bit late or too far off in the distance. So now that we know where we got, so we're gonna go see if we can't get close enough to get a shot. Of
made it all the way back to where I thought they landed, but I think they're tucked in this grass behind. I glassed, I can't, can't see them. Tried to come up close to see if we can get them pushed to swim out, but that didn't work either. So I'm gonna head back to the blind. Look again, it's actually probably about close to calling it this morning, but that black head this morning was, was worth it. That was the tricky one in this whole trip, and to get that down, just got two left in Argentina, the red shoveler and the Brazilian teal. Those are just a couple that we'll grind out and eventually get those two, but that black head, that was, that was the important one. Shoveler, shoveler! Yeah! Shoveler! Woo! What? Tell me you were fooling! We did a big walk, saw two red shovelers that landed, went and tried to find them and couldn't, couldn't find them, so we were walking back and I decided to take a shortcut instead of walking land. And this Drake red shoveler came right by as we were walking back. That's just how luck happens. Gorgeous, gorgeous shoveler. That's awesome, it's been a great morning. Blackhead and a red shoveler, that just leaves one left here in Argentina. Brazilian teal. Just amazing down here. The amount of birds, the different species, the hunting, the culture, everything's awesome. And we're gonna call it morning now. Start picking these birds up and that's awesome. Red shoveler, blackhead, one morning, leaving one left here, Brazilian teal. You always hear people say that it's sometimes better to be lucky than good. All too often, that's the case when it comes to hunting. This was one of those times but I was happy to chalk it up as a win. That single red shoveler made for species number 12, and there was only one more that I came to Argentina for, but I still had yet to lay my eyes on one. At least with the widgeon and the shoveler, we had seen them in the area. The Brazilian teal was nowhere to be found. My mind was already wandering to worst case scenarios and what ifs. I quickly shut those thoughts down and remembered what happened in 2020 when we were hunting the fulvus. I instantly knew what we had to do. We just got everything loaded up in the caravan here. We've got about a two hour flight to Inter Rios. And talking to the outfitter Patricio down there who we were with earlier this year, big game hunting, it sounds like there are a lot of Brazilian teals in the area. But being able to get 12 out of 13 with Brian and Maxi, it made it to where I'm gonna jump through a couple extra hoops on this trip, try to get all 13 in a single trip, which would save a, obviously another trip down to Argentina. Gotta go to Peru, oh, so I wanna leave that open check. just in case okay. we have to go to Peru a second time. Thank you for arranging this. <laughs> well, we're just getting into the Estancia and into Rios. It was about four hours total travel, which wasn't too bad. And the good thing in talking to Patrick, he said it's almost a complete opposite on birds. Here, the Brazilian teal are actually the most populated right now. Must be the weather or whatever it is, but excited to get out this afternoon. It sounds like we're gonna see a bunch of them. And after chasing them for the last week, I'm excited to see what one actually looks like. We're just getting set up for the afternoon here. We're hunting a small, and I mean small pond, but there were about 50 ducks on when we pulled up here. Couldn't tell what any of them were. We're gonna go tuck on the other side so we'll have the sun in our back. Ducks will be coming in. Again, we're just looking for one Brazilian teal out of this. A lot of movement to get here, but Patrick said there are a bunch of them around, so hopefully tonight one rolls in. Two ducks, two ducks. Hey, hey, I see, I see. Two more, two more. And there it is, just like that. Five minutes into sitting, the Brazilian teal down, number 13 in Argentina. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I don't think I can wait, I gotta go see what it is. I get this last one in hand.
Brazilian teal, this is what we move for right here. Move to a spot that they were plentiful, and they are, because holy smokes, there's a group circling around us right here. It's number 13 in Argentina. Argentina is known to have 13 species of waterfall, and this is, for me, number 13. It's an absolute gorgeous duck. But I think we're gonna get tucked back in that blind because I don't think we're done with the shooting this afternoon. That's awesome. Big group coming in. Straight forward. That's a male. Okay. Right? Yeah. So on the males, it's got a black head and obviously the red beak. That's pretty cool. Look at those feet though. I mean, the color on those is just amazing. Seeing pictures and everything of the wings, they definitely stick out when you see them cupped and coming in like that. Once again, making a move paid off in a big way, and I was able to check off the final bird for Argentina. By far one of the most identifiable birds of the 13 that I was able to get on this leg of the journey. I still don't understand the factors in play that push this one particular species further north. If it was too cold, why were the other 12 species further south? Why was it that once we moved north, the overwhelming majority of birds were all Brazilian teal? What was there that wasn't further south? These were all questions that I asked myself, but I didn't have time to let it slow me down. It was time to move to the next location. This was the part of the journey that had captivated me from the beginning, hunting birds in the Andes. I've been in some high elevations in pursuit of sheep all over the world, but knowing we'd be pushing 15,000 feet for waterfall was something I couldn't quite get my mind wrapped around. As anxious as I was to be able to get up in the mountains, there was one bird to scratch off at sea level, the knob-billed duck. What does a knob bill look like when it's flying? It's a big bird? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's got big wings, uh -huh. long wingspan. It's dark towards the center, and the top of the head is going to be white and like iridescent blue and green. Okay, yeah. okay. I think that's the only one I haven't seen with my, with my own eyes. You'll, as soon as you'll see, you'll recognize it. It flies like a duck. Uh -huh. It's not as fast as like a cinnamon teal, Okay. Uh, but you'll recognize it immediately. Okay. All right. Did it just get set up on, the, on a point over here? Yeah, we're going to sit on on the right side here of the marsh, okay. and you'll have the birds coming in this way, and then they'll turn around back here, and then come back this way. Okay, and yep. most of it will be past shooting, right? Past shooting, Okay, yep. Yep. perfect. did a couple of hunts on the coast hoping to get lucky, and although they were arguably some of the best shoots of the slam, they didn't turn up what I needed. After three days, we made a few adjustments to our approach, and I finally had the opportunity I was looking for. There's a group coming from the left. Coming from the left. First thing, two knob bill ducks down. Look at the knob on that thing. Dos machos. Dos machos. Dos machos. Good boy. Well, knob bill duck. This took three days hunting the coast, but this is what we were hunting the coast for in Peru. And man, it is awesome. It's probably one of the coolest looking ducks that I've been able to take in my life. Just look at that. Just amazing and so different from everything else. Number 14 was in hand, and it's time to head up to the mountains for the remaining six species. So 
we just made it into the hunting area in one of the first little ponds that we stopped and looked at. There were two crested ducks, actually Andy and crested ducks. So we're just gonna get everything set up here, getting the mic on, the shotgun out. We'll make a little stock in here. We are at 14,200 feet elevation. Not what I expected up here. Kind of opened up and it got flat and there's little ponds and water everywhere. Damn, there are two Andean geese right there too. Right there. So many options. So we actually started glassing. There's a pair of Andean geese and then a pair of giant coots all right here in this little pond system. down. That was pretty awesome. Snuck in. It must have been about a 40 yard shot right when we cleared out of those rocks. They started to take off. The other one circled back and landed on the other side. First mountain species, Andean goose. The one I was most looking forward to. Uh, shaking with excitement. That's awesome. We're at 14.5 elevation, that is 14,500 feet. And we got out of the elevation of where we were driving up and it really just flattens out here. And Angelo will say it just flattens out and there are lakes everywhere. And as soon as it flattened out, there are literally lakes everywhere. We saw Andean crested so far, Andean goose, and a giant coo, all within the first two ponds. First two ponds. He said there were a bunch of birds here and wasn't lying. There are a bunch of birds here. And I like that. I like that stalking in. That was cool. Yeah. I don't like the pounding headache I have right now, but I like the I like the stalking in. walked around to the other side of the lake. <clears throat> Angelo's got his waders. He's gonna go and grab this goose on the other side, but there's some coots tucked on the other shore and there's the other Indian goose went over there. So we're gonna try a good old Western drive here of all things. And looking at it, I didn't walk very far. It must've been a couple hundred yards, but I am sucking wind and have a massive headache. 
massive. I am out of shape at 14,500 feet. It's up, here it comes. Just coming right at us. That worked out perfect. Goose came right at us. I think I'll pick this one up too. Indian goose, it's pretty awesome. This is the hen, smaller than the drake that's over there. Angelo's gonna pick that one up and bring it this way. Well, how cool is that? A goose at 14,500 feet. Man, oh, I gotta show you, it's got spurs coming out of its wing. Angelo had told me about those, but seeing them, that's awesome. Man. Angelo was talking earlier about these spurs and over time they develop these what they do is when they leave the ponds here they actually use their wings to help them get out of the water because if you look there's like a little 8 10 inch lip so they use those and actually drive up out of the water oh man such a cool bird Angelo's picking up the drake behind us a pair of Andean geese at 14,500 feet. That is sweet. And I am feeling it right now. Yeah, that's definitely the great thing to look Yeah. Man. How big do you think that is compared to like a Canadian? So this would be bigger than a lesser Canadian by uh -huh. far. Uh -huh. <clears throat> There's a shape so different. Yeah. The weight wise, it's probably about the same, but a Canadian is just longer. Their necks, Their necks longer. Yeah. But it may even, like, not by much though. This is deceiving. Like, it's longer than what you think it is. Uh -huh. It's just so much feathers. Yeah. But weight wise, they this. It looks smaller from a distance. Yeah. Though. Weight wise, this may actually weigh more. Oh, that's awesome. A pair of Andean geese. That's awesome, buddy. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. We made quick work of the first Andean goose and then topped it off by setting up on the second of the pair that we initially jumped. I couldn't have asked for a more perfect scenario. It turned out that this tactic would be applied to the rest of the birds on the list. Locate the ones we needed and figure out a way to use the shoreline to our advantage and somehow get within shotgun range. I also noticed right away that the birds up here weren't flying back and forth from one place to another. For the most part, it seemed like they stuck to one body of water. Luckily for us, there was plenty of places to look, and once again, I felt like it was just a matter of time before it all came together. As we made our way to the big body of water near the Alpine village, two Andean speckled teal presented me with an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Stop this one right here. I just go slowly. Can yeah. you shoot from this side? Is that close enough? Because you can just slowly walk over there. It's 85 yards from, from here. here. So I got to cut. I got to cut. Yeah. So if like you it. go, just slowly walk that ledge. Yep. Get to the edge of that water and then. I'm going to roll with you. two Andean crested ducks. Do you see them? Oh yeah. The, is the drake the one, the larger one obviously with the yeah. white on it? Yeah, that's the one. Yep. And then a little behind it to the right, there's two coot just swimming around. Yep. So I think if we, if you sneak up this, the side of the road and use that as cover, you might get within shooting range for the shotgun from this side right here. Okay. Yeah. Worth a try. For sure. We're just gonna hit this ditch over here and then move over. I only gotta cut about 60 yards and we'll pop over.
across. We're just gonna make a run for it. Triple, giant coop too. That worked perfect. We used this road edge to sneak and then just popped over. Andy and Crested Duck got a double. And then there was a giant coot right there too. Which is truly ridiculous. Just got three right on this sneak. That's awesome. There are birds all over this lake. Picking up the giant coot at the same time was a welcome bonus on that stalk. All things considered, and with everyone showing signs of severe elevation sickness, we had to head back down the mountain. Now sitting at 18 species, the end was in sight, and we had only one more day to find the last two ducks. Indian goose flying out of town. Indian teal, giant coot. There's two ruddies over there. Way out there. The shore route. I think we got a poon teal right here. Right there. Just put its head down. Blue bill. Yep. We started out on the same alpine lake that we left off on the night before and the sunrise revealed a puna teal that was feeding tight to shore in a small cove. The terrain offered a perfect opportunity for another stalk, and I was able to get well within range as I timed my movement with the bird's feeding habits. Oh, we just spotted our first puna teal, it's just a single over here, and it's kind of tucked in a bay area that we can make a little play on this one, get the shotgun, everything set up right now. We did see a couple of ruddy ducks out there as well, but we're going to go after this puna teal first because that's the only one we've seen so far. The finale's ready to roll. Oh, oh, that worked out awesome. The puna teal we saw on the bay right here, he swam, swam around. And we just used that and popped right over. He started to take off and I wasn't letting him get away because this is the only puna teal we've seen up here. Hunting at 14,500 feet. Oh, that's awesome. That bird looks gorgeous. This right here was going to be the toughest one to get on the whole trip, so. This makes the last one, the ruddy duck, very, very doable because there is a bunch of them that we've seen so far. That was freaking awesome. Oh, you weren't lying. He is gorgeous. I think I'm just going to keep the waiter on. Nice and warm. Wow. Look at that. Color on his head and his bill. Gorgeous bird. Angelo let me know well in advance this was going to be the toughest one to get. Puna teal. Just gorgeous. Thank you, sir. An hour into the last day, and I was already looking for the final bird on the list the Indian ruddy duck. I'm confident in saying that they were the most prevalent bird at this elevation, but they didn't seem to stick close to the shoreline. I was hoping to catch one or two in the early morning hours as they fed in the shallow weed beds, but we were going to have to get lucky. Spotting, stalking, ruddy ducks on the shore of all things here in 
There's a group of four tucked on this rock, so we're just gonna try and get as close as we can here. And I think with how it lays, we'll be able to get within shotgun range if we use the rocks. Oh, these things have been tricky because they haven't flown. All they've been doing is just diving and then all of a sudden appearing about 50 yards out in the water. So we'll see what happens. All right, they're right here. They're literally in the wide open. So just stay here and fill from a distance. I'm gonna just try to make a loop and run right at them. That was it right there. Andy and Ruddy Duck to complete the South American Waterfall Slam in a single season. I didn't think it would come down to the Ruddy Duck, but man, it is the toughest one here because they hardly fly. Angelo kind of prepped me on it before we got here and it's 100% true. They just, they just do not fly because they have no reason to, but what an awesome experience up here over 14,000 feet to complete it. Started in Argentina, completed it in Peru. Can't wait to get this guy in my hands. I actually see him been glassing him up a ton the last two days, but whew, 20 birds in a single season, South America. It's hard to put into words how this one felt once it was over. Sure, there was excitement and even a little relief, but something felt different. The drive, the wonder, the pressure, it was all there just like it was for the North America quest, but there was a new element to it this time around, the culture. I didn't even realize it when it was happening, but I became part of this place. It was more than just completing a task or checking the box on a list. I found myself ingrained in the fiber of the places where I pursued these birds, much like the athlete who feeds off the energy in the arena. I was fueled by the experience as a whole, the food, the language, the sights and sounds of the ocean, the people of the Alpine village. These are all the things that will forever stick out in my mind from this. These are the things that made this a journey. Looking back, the slam was just a metaphorical destination. To make it even sweeter, I was able to have my dad by my side when it all came to an end. What better way to complete another slam than to have the man by my side who introduced me to hunting all those years ago. This journey started out feeling like I was the one giving the pep talk in the locker room, but come to find out, I was just one of the players on the field. Whoa!